Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 14th of November, nearly Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, as always, this is useful. Please like, subscribe, comment and share and hit that bell icon to get notified of new videos. As always, um, the updates are broken down into chapters. You can kind of click along the bottom here to jump to certain updates or in the video description. I've got it all broken down, but you can see the high level right there. New videos this week. So last week's update, if you missed it, was a huge, just over one hour summary of all of the key Ignite announcements. Then I did a video diving into Azure Spot Virtual Machines, the ability to get really cheap compute, providing you're willing to get kicked off if that capacity is required for regular on-demand processing. But it's great if I have some kind of resumable workload that's not super time critical. We had our 80,000 subscriber Ask Me Anything session on Wednesday, so that recording is available. And then on Thursday, I did a little video introducing a new website I've put together, uh, learn.onboardtoazure.com, which is really just a collection of my videos from my YouTube channel, but in an order to kind of give you maybe a path if you're trying to learn Azure, of a path to take, but I also reference from the Microsoft Learn documentation, when to take certain exams. It's really just something that will maybe help along your learning journey, really nothing more than that. Then, when we think about new updates, so on the compute side, .NET 6.0 was released, and so there's a whole bunch of support for .NET 6.0. This includes things like Azure Static Web Apps for the .NET 6.0 Blazor WebAssembly apps. Um, Azure Functions supports that serverless offering, supports .NET 6.0, as does the Azure App Service. So as quickly as that was released, a whole bunch of the compute services added support for that. Speaking of Azure Functions, the new Azure Functions Runtime 4.0 is GA. So this, as mentioned, has the kind of the .NET 6.0, both in process and isolated process but also Node.js 14, Python 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, Java 8 and 11, PowerShell 7, and a bunch of custom handlers. The PowerShell on Linux skew Azure functions. So now obviously PowerShell is cross-platform. It's not just Windows, it's Linux as well. So now I can actually have PowerShell running on my Azure functions that are using the Linux skew. I get to pick I don't want this hosted on Windows or Linux. Well, now if I select the Linux SKU, I can still use um, PowerShell. That's for the consumption and elastic premium function SKUs. Moving on to networking, uh, Route Server did go generally available. So I've done a whole deep dive video on Route Server. But if you consider that, well, I have some maybe network virtual appliance, maybe it's a gateway, it communicates to a certain IP space. In the past, I would have to create user-defined routes on my subnets to make it use those NVAs to get to that address space. What Route Server does is it allows an interaction between the NVAs and the virtual network's BGP, its routes. So it establishes a BGP session with the NVAs so they can exchange IP information so I don't have to maintain those UDRs. And it opens up a, a lot of exciting scenarios where maybe I used a load balancer before for multiple MBAs, or maybe I don't need to now because I can have multiple um, targets for the same destination IP range. So route service now GA. Express route private peering support for Azure Virtual Desktop Short Path. So there's kind of quite a mouthful there. But essentially this boils down to, if we think about Azure Virtual Desktop, really there's the idea that, hey, there's the Azure Cloud and somewhere there's a virtual network. And that virtual network has our session host deployed to it. So we have our various hosts deployed. Now Azure Virtual Desktop adds a whole bunch of infrastructure around it, it as a PaaS service. One of those kind of important ones is the gateway. And the way this actually works is the session hosts actually establish a reverse connect transport to the gateways over 443. So the gateways don't have to connect to the session hosts. They establish that path outbound over 443. 
When I, as a regular user, connect, well, I ordinarily go via the gateway, which then, over that session, gets me to the session host. But if I'm sitting here on my network, maybe what's been established is an express route. So we have that private peering, connecting those IP spaces together using our express route connection. So what the RDP short path actually does is yes, the initial connection will still go via that gateway over that kind of internet facing point. But once it's established, what then will happen is over this connection, well now I'll establish a direct RDP. So now over that private peering, I will establish this connection. So now that's kind of UDP, is it 30, 3390? So once that initial session is established, the ongoing communications will now be direct. So it's gonna have a lower latency, a better performance for me. So that functionality, hey, that's now GA. So if I'm using Azure Virtual Desktop and I have an express route private peering connection between my on-premises and the virtual network or peered in some way, I've got a path, hey, I can now use that capability. Uh, carrying on, on the storage side, so archive rehydration priority update has gone GA. If we think storage has kind of that hot tier, the cool tier, the archive tier, I remember the archive tier was actually offline. It's great if I just need to keep data for a really long time, I wanna pay as little as possible, I don't need immediate access to it. If I do need to access it, I have to rehydrate it, I have to bring it out of archive into cool or hot. Well, that takes time. When I do that rehydration, I can do it as kind of a standard rehydration or a high priority. High priority, obviously, I have to wait less time. I think it's typically sub hour. What this now lets me do is if, for example, I did it as standard and it's still in a pending state, it's not started the rehydration, I can change it to the high priority. So I did it as standard, circumstances have changed, I wanna change it to high priority. As long as it's in that pending state, I can go ahead and change it. Database, a huge number of updates. PostgreSQL 14 and Citus 10.2 are now supported in the Postgres Hyperscale offering. Remember the Hyperscale offering is that Azure managed database using the Citus extension that lets me essentially shard and partition my data over multiple nodes so I get huge scale, huge performance. With these updates, I get better scaling, a higher number of database connections, uh, better performance for heavier workloads, and a bunch of other feature improvements. So that's all good stuff. MySQL Flexible Server, remember Flexible Server is the version built on virtual machines, gives me the optional high availability automatic failover, AZ support, stop and start burstable VMs. Well now for that MySQL flexible server, there's now native Terraform support generally available. So I can actually go and provision those services using Terraform directly. PostgreSQL single server, so single server remember is the initial offering on that custom container type uh, architecture, now has long-term retention for Azure Backup in GA. Now I can store up to 10 years my backups using standard or archive tier. Cosmos DB has names, indexes, and glow root support. So this enables me, the names indexes, enables me to define a new index with a name for a specific column. Glow root is this open source app performance management tool. Now, directly through the Cosmos DB Cassandra API, I can leverage this to monitor the application without having to actually update my app in any way. Azure SQL Managed Instance now has distributed transactions generally available. If we now think about, I'm interacting using .NET or T-SQL, a distributed transaction is where I have some atomic operation I'm doing that's actually talking to multiple databases. So now those multiple databases can all be part of one transaction. That's really the big deal. 
Azure SQL Hyperscale now has SQL maintenance windows and advanced notifications. So I can tweak that maintenance window to some configurable one that meets my requirements. And I'm gonna get 24 hours notification of pending operations. And then SQL on virtual machines now has multi um, subnet support. If I'm running SQL Server on Azure IaaS virtual machines, what we used to have is this idea, I'd have to have a load balancer. This worked around some of the challenges that you can't move IP addresses. Well, what this actually now uses is a distributed network name that removes the need to have to have this load balancer as part of my SQL Server deployment, which means now I can span multiple subnets. So if it's an availability group or failover cluster instance, they can now span different subnets through this distributed network name. And then hardware accelerated pools for Azure Spark. This is where I'm using kind of this Azure Synapse and Azure Synapse can use these GPU accelerated Azure Spark clusters. So the GPUs can be really useful for certain types of work I'm doing. It could be data integration pipelines, could be machine learning models, a whole bunch of other things. You've got this NVIDIA Rapid technology, so when I use that with the Microsoft, Microsoft Hummingbird library, I can really get a lot of acceleration over just regular CPUs. So I can now take advantage of that. Miscellaneous, Azure Site Recovery now supports a multi-IP configuration failover. I can go and look at my Azure Virtual Machine where it has multiple IP configurations, and now, through Azure Site Recovery, I can actually go and look at the secondary IP configuration and set failover and test failover configurations um, for that secondary IP. Azure Bastion actually has a number of updates. So Azure Bastion now has a native client support in preview. Now this is for the standard SKU, which also adds manual scaling, custom ports, cross OS, RDP and SSH. I, I can SSH to Windows, I can RDP to Linux. Well now, instead of having to go through the portal and have kind of the RDP SSH pop up in the portal, I can actually use the native client. What that actually looks like, and I can hopefully show this quickly. So let's jump over and open up a terminal. Oh. Let me just get the right screen over here. So what I can actually do with this, I'm gonna paste the command in. So I use the AZ Network Bastion um, CLI command. And once I do that, just to switch over. So if I go ahead and paste this command in, yep, paste anyway. Notice it's saying, hey, it's in preview and under development, but what it's doing over here is actually connecting directly with my native client. So it's asking me to type in my credentials. So here we can see it's launching the native client. And now from this, but you can see I'm now connected through. So I'm using the local client, but I'm actually connecting using Azure Bastion. So that's a, a nice little new feature that you can now do in preview through that standard SKU. So again, we need the standard SKU to actually go and do that. And it's just an option actually. If we go and quickly look at the portal, we can see where that is. So if I jump over here and look at my bastions in my configuration, just make sure you're on standard. And then there's an option in preview. I've turned off the custom portal, which is why you're not seeing it. There's an option to actually enable that native client capability. So that's right there as well. Carrying on and again, looking at Azure Bastion, let me just get this open. It also now has support for IP based connections. So one of the changes they made to Azure Bastion, remember Azure Bastion is essentially that managed jump box. I connect to it, then I can connect to resources on the virtual network. So they added support for peered VNets. I can go and get to other virtual machines on peered VNets, not just the VNet where the Bastion is deployed to. What they're adding here is through the Azure Bastion, I can connect to any 
IP-based resource that the Bastion has a line of sight to. So that could be on-premises, it could be another cloud, it just needs to have some connection to it. For example, uh, ExpressRoute. I have ExpressRoute private peering. Between that VNet and on-prem, I'll be able to go and get to my on-prem resources. Again, standard SKU only. Then Azure Security Center has a whole bunch of updates. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these. If we quickly jump over to that, and look, I maybe didn't open, let's try that one more time. It's very irregular when it works or doesn't work. But if we go and look, we can see, well, obviously there was the rename to Microsoft Defender for the Cloud. I talked about this last week about the new AWS integrations all through the APIs, but it also talks about, hey, new security actions based on the data sensitivity that Azure Purview is actually gonna ascertain and label. The new Azure Security Benchmark version three, so that's just gonna be there in your Azure Security Center. When you look at the different regulatory compliance, that's now gonna show up as a whole bunch of improvements and mappings to different industry frameworks. I talked about the Azure Sentinel bi-directional alert sync before with the Azure Security Center. So the Microsoft Defender for Cloud, I should say now, and Sentinel, if actions are found and closed, it will replicate either way. New types of logins I can push, mapping to the, the meter attack framework, and a whole bunch of other things. So I've got the link in the description below. You can go and, go and look at that. Um, but again, some nice changes introduced there. And that's it for this week. I don't know what is going on with my demos today. Something doesn't like me. But I hope that was useful. As always, until next week, take care.